Vitaly. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Greg. My students stopped thinking about work in the in mid November on Veterans Day. I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank at you. At least Greg. they were thinking. At least they were thinking about work at some point. Indeed, if there is a stop point, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you everyone for coming to our uh, final MIF Plus Plus seminar in this calendar year 2023. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Alexey Garber from the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, who will talk about metric spaces of lattices and periodic point sets. Over to you, Alexey. Thank you, Vitaly, and thanks everyone for joining. It's uh, already holidays, uh, but uh, uh, there's always some time to do a lot of uh, research. So uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the metric spaces of lattices and periodic point sets. And uh, this is a joint work with uh, Nicolo Zava from uh, IST Austria and uh, with uh, Giga Wirk from uh, University of Ljubljana. <clears throat> uh, so what I'm going to do, it's, uh, so I'm a mathematician, so it's, uh, the talk is going to be pretty mathematical. I'll try to kind of introduce uh, everything, not in, uh, in always a rigorous way, but uh, I'll try to be rigorous as well. So unfortunately, there will be some proofs and uh, maybe not that many pictures, but I'll try to do with pictures as well. So uh, <clears throat> what is the motivation? And uh, in general, what uh, I'm trying to do? So suppose uh, we are given two point sets in d-dimensional space. And it's not only three dimensions, uh, but in three dimensions, it's uh, it's also a relevant question. Uh, so we want to understand how close are they to each other. So basically, we try to see when uh, we can say, well, these two sets could be obtained by uh, deformation or by slightly moving the points and so on and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, the usual mathematical answer, which is Hausdorff distance, which I avoid uh, introducing here. It's too complicated for that uh, because it uh, may give you the situation when you have, uh, let's say, one point and a point set with, which consists of a lot of points, but the distance is relatively small. <clears throat> so uh, the additional requirement, and uh, that comes from uh, basically uh, research interests related to study of uh, atomic structure of solids or crystals. So additional requirement will try to make it relevant uh, to the point sets that are used to model physical net. And uh, basically <clears throat> that's uh, the next thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to introduce what uh, infinite point, set I'm, point sets I'm going to work with. So what are the point sets uh, that are there? So, uh, the main object, uh, and uh, it was introduced uh, by uh, Boris Delaunay, it's called uh, Delaunay set. So we say that uh, Delaunay set in d-dimensional uh, d-dimensional space is uh, <clears throat> any set which is uh, at the same time uh, uniformly discrete and uh, relatively dense. So what it means, so uniformly discrete means that there are uh, the points of the set cannot be uh, too close to each other. And uh, that's uh, this part uh, of the uh, definition here. So basically there exists a packing radius. So positive number such that uh, if we consider uh, open balls in d-dimensional space, then every open ball covers at most one point of it. Or which is the same if we uh, <coughs> center these balls or circles in that picture at the points, then they will not overlap uh, by internal points. So they may overlap in the boundary, but not uh, in internal points. Uh, or another condition is that the minimal distance between the points is at least two times R. So that's uh, the first part, which is uniformly discrete. A relatively dense part means that there are no uh, big voids for uh, 
for the settle. And that's the same that there exists a covering radius. So there exists another uh, constant, R capital, such that every closed ball of radius R contains at least one pole. So there are no empty balls of a uh, large size in this set. So that's relatively dense, right? So uniformly discrete means that the points cannot be too close. Rel relatively dense means that there are no big voids. So that's something that we expect from, uh, from the matter. If we think uh, that uh, atoms are model modeled uh, as points, which is uh, not always convenient, but at least uh, we can do that. Okay. So that's the Delana set. Uh, and uh, of course it is too generic. <clears throat> so we want to uh, use some uh, more uh, specific uh, classes of Delana sets. Uh, so one of those are lattices and that's uh, what goes back, I think to at least uh, 19th century crystallography, right? So we're, uh, all crystallographic groups or three-dimensional crystallographic groups uh, were studied by uh, Fedorov, I think, and Schoenflies. So uh, if we have a basis uh, of d vectors in d-dimensional space, then the set of all integer linear combinations, so we consider only uh, integer linear combinations, not uh, uh, real linear combinations. Uh, so then the set of all integer linear combinations is called the lattice. So basically uh, what we are dealing with, we are dealing with uh, very ordered point sets. And uh, in that case, uh, unit cell uh, of the lattice is just the parallel pipette uh, that consists of uh, all linear combinations now with the real coefficients that are from zero to one, excluding one. So actually, Excluding that one makes it <clears throat> a little bit weird because it's called, it's what is going to be half open set, but uh, that allows us to treat it as real uh, fundamental region in terms of uh, let's say group structure or in terms of addition. So we can tile everything without overlaps. Okay, so that's uh, the lattice and uh, the Next thing that uh, we can get from that is what is called periodic point set. Uh, so we have a, a lattice, we have a unit cell, and uh, we, for every finite subset of that unit cell, which, which we call motif, we create uh, uh, another set uh, just by translating every point of that motif by all the lattice vectors. <clears throat> so then what we're going to get is called a uh, periodic point set. So for example, here uh, in the left part, we can see uh, the integer lattice. So this is uh, Z2 or in general ZD. So we have uh, all possible integer vectors, right? So then this is a basis of that lattice. So we have two vectors and consider all integer combinations. So this is not unique way, uh, not the only way to describe this lattice. I can actually uh, take another basis, for example, these two vectors, and that's uh, going to give me the same lattice. So that there is no uniqueness here. The same lattice can be described in many ways. Uh, the set in the right is a periodic point set. So actually, uh, so let me highlight unit cell. So that's the unit cell. And actually uh, these parts over here, they are excluded because uh, no, uh, coefficient of the vector can be of the basis vector can be one. So here, uh, another example. So that's another unit cell, and it's a generally complicated question to understand uh, <clears throat> whether two representations of the lattice give us or two uh, bases give us the same lattice. So that's what uh, what is called a reduction theory, and I'm not going to go there. Uh, but sometimes it's useful to choose the basis which satisfies certain geometric properties. So the set in the right-hand side, it's also, uh, it's not a lattice, it's a periodic point set. And, and uh, it involves uh, a motif or of uh, four points, right? So 
here's uh, a basis and then uh, these four sets will give me uh, a motif so I can write it as uh, Z2 plus uh, that square over here. And again, this is not the only way uh, to represent uh, that periodic point set as periodic point set. I can use uh, another basis of the same lattice or I can do even uh, something a bit more crazier. I can, for example, double uh, those vectors and then I'm going to end up with uh, 16 uh, points. Uh, so 16 points uh, in the motif. Or I can do uh, even so other stuff. So I can double one vector, triple another vector, and so on and so forth. So there are uh, generally countably many ways <clears throat> uh, to represent this periodic point set as periodic points. And actually, I can do the same thing uh, with this with the lattice in the left. I can say that I can take uh, this basis. Then it's going to be double lattice or uh, lattice with uh, twice, uh, so one half of the points, right? And then use the motif, motif of size two, of cardinality. So that's kind of the representation. In general, what I'm dealing with is just a lattice, a very periodic point set with some uh, finite collection of points, which is, uh, which is motif. Okay, that was uh, kind of very classical and uh, generally simple situation. So something which is uh, different and that uh, is in general motivated by uh, quasi crystals. So that's uh, how we can get quasi periodic sets. And uh, that's one of the uh, goals of my talk, not only talking about periodic sets, but trying to uh, kind of give some mathematical perspective into aperiodic point sets. So how we can deal with aperiodic point sets in a similar setting. So that's what is called a uh, family of cut and project sets. And sometimes uh, they are also called model sets. <clears throat> and they are uh, generally considered uh, one of very reasonable models for uh, aperiodic crystals or quasi-crystals. So what we're dealing here with, and this is relatively formal definition. I'll have some pictures a little bit later when it's a bit easier. So here we have uh, <clears throat> two spaces and for simplified version, I will consider only Euclidean spaces. So one is uh, d-dimensional space and that's uh, what is called direct space where our uh, set will live, and then we kind of lift it uh, with m additional dimensions. So this is what is called uh, internal space, and this is uh, direct space, also called uh, physical space sometimes. So then in that total space of uh, d plus m dimensions, uh, we consider a lattice. And then, <clears throat> so what we do, uh, we in the in the internal space we cut our set so we consider a certain window and that's a relatively compact set there uh, then uh, we cut this uh, the lattice using one projection and then project on uh, on the direct space uh, with another projection so formally uh, our cut and project space and this is cut and project space with mm. uh, lattice gamma window W and two projections, right? So that's mm. that's the formal definition. So, uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, usually there are some requirements of the projections. So mm. let me uh, sweep it under the rug and go to the pictures. So uh, <clears throat> this is uh, one of the uh, very basic examples. So here we have, uh, so that's what is called uh, Fibonacci sequence. And so what we are dealing here with, so uh, the direct space is the horizontal lines, line. So that's that line over here. Uh, the internal space is also one dimension is over here. So then uh, we have a lattice and let me show you the 
uh, basis. So a basis of that lattice, and this is the corresponding uh, unit cell. And you can see that this picture kind of repeats each uh, repeat, repeats itself everywhere. So this is really a lattice. <coughs> Right, so then uh, as the window is the thing that we use to cut here, we use uh, the interval uh, from uh, negative tau, so negative reciprocal of tau to one, so where tau is the golden mean. So that's uh, this uh, window over here. So that's window, so we cut uh, our space, so cu cut our lattice with uh, with horizontal strip, right? So that's the uh, projection uh, pi two, the projection on the vertical line, and then every point that we cut, and that's uh, these are wide points over here. So uh, one important thing in here is one is so one is excluded, so that means that that point is excluded as well. So those white dots that we cut and then we project them. So in the end, <clears throat> we get uh, that sequence of A's and B's. And uh, one can check that uh, the <clears throat> ratio of the lengths will be exactly uh, golden mean. So that's a way to get uh, irrational things from the construction, which is kind of rational because orthogonal projections are kind of rational, right? Well, we have vectors here that are irrational, but that's fine. In general, we can uh, we can do that with <coughs> or something similar with rational things as well. And uh, this, what we are going to get, the set, which is called Fibonacci sequence or one dimensional Fibonacci tiling will be an aperiodic set. So that means that it looks like periodic, so this the uh, <clears throat> the local structures repeat themselves, but uh, it's never periodic. So we cannot find a translation that preserves uh, the set. So that's one of the mathematical ways to construct aperiodic things. And uh, another good example here is uh, Alexei. Could I briefly the... ask about the Fibonacci sequence? Yes. Uh... So the vectors were quite non-trivial, but uh, the projection, so the final uh, sequence, is it does it indeed consist of integer numbers? No. So there are. Uh, so actually, uh, what you are going to get here is uh, the length of a is going to be uh, square root of five plus one over two, and uh, the length of b is going to be one. So uh, you will not get uh, integers. But, uh, well, roughly speaking, and that's uh, what you can get. So if you go from that point, from the origin to the right, and count how many A's and B's you have, you'll get Fibonacci numbers. OK, all right. So it's, yeah, um, so the, mm -hmm. so it's, so it's, it's the sequence, but uh, not the yes. answer. Yeah, the sequence is there. It's hidden inside, but it's not there. So. Uh, <clears throat> Another example and uh, uh, or another way to obtain that same tiling. So let me uh, write it here. So if you substitute every A with AB and every B with A, uh, then uh, you'll get the right part here, right? So basically it's a way to get it as what is called substitution tiling. And uh, here you get Fibonacci numbers. So the lengths are Fibonacci numbers. So. Uh, Fibonacci numbers come uh, here not as numbers, but as counting something. Yeah, so feel free to interrupt me. It's uh, I know that it's uh, slightly more mathematical than usual and not at all applied. So that's why I, I'm ready for interruptions. I'll try to answer everything I know. So <clears throat> the uh, another example of cutting project set is uh, the famous Penrose tiling. <clears throat> and it's not uh, very honest to say that it is a cut and project set because it's a uh, tiling. But what you can think of is that 
the vertices of uh, all these rhombi are obtained as cut and project uh, using cut and project scheme. So you can get it using a uh, cut and project process. And then you kind of impose additional structure of the time. Okay, uh, so that's one way to obtain uh, aperiodic point sets. Another way which is uh, uh, generally connected, so that's what is called substitution tilings, and that's where uh, I will not describe uh, the process in general, but uh, we'll just give a picture. I kind of showed how to do that with Fibonacci. Here's the same uh, or similar process with Penrose styling. So what is uh, what is going on? So uh, one can take uh, two basic tiles, which are rhombi, uh, thin rhombos and uh, fat rhombos, then inflate them uh, with certain coefficient and then subdivide <coughs> into the uh, tiles, into the original tiles. So that's how you can get Penrose tiling. Well, there is additional decoration here that is used, but in general, that's the process. That's uh, decoration is needed to get uh, a nicer picture because you need to decide where to basically, so how to basically connect these parts because you can see they are not honestly inflated. There are extra parts and so on and so forth. So uh, why, why these sets? So why am I interested in these sets? <clears throat> Lattices and periodic point sets, there are usual models uh, for periodic crystals. So usual ways to model uh, periodic, periodically structured uh, atoms and cut and project sets and substitution tilings or the point sets com coming from substitution tilings, they're uh, they can be used and they, they are frequently used as models for aperiodic crystals or quasi-crystals. So, uh, and one of the uh, ways to see that is that uh, if we consider diffractive picture of uh, those tilings or those point sets, those are really nice. So here's uh, an example. It looks very familiar uh, or it may look very familiar to those uh, who know about uh, Nobel Prize uh, awarded to Dan Schachtman for quasi-crystals. So this is not that picture. So actually uh, this uh, particular picture, I think uh, it comes from a uh, prior work of McKay and that's a uh, diffraction picture of Penrose type. So what he did, so he made a large model of uh, Penrose tiling, so basically pinching uh, holes in the vertices of the Penrose tiling uh, on some, I think it was metal uh, sheet, and then uh, created diffractive diffraction picture from that. All right, so that's what's go. So that's uh, diffraction of uh, <clears throat> of the Penrose tiling or one of those tiles. So, and that was before Schachtman, as far as I remember. So, uh, aperiodic uh, sets that constructed in the same way usually have nice diffractive pictures, and that's what is kind of expected for uh, from aperiodic crystals. Okay, so these are the sets. Uh, so, what uh, what am I interested in? Uh, <clears throat> There are two things uh, that I'm going to be interested in. Uh, they both are mathematical. So the first one is uh, qualitative properties. So we're going to say uh, that two Dallin sets uh, are bounded distance equivalent or they are at bounded distance. If uh, there exists a bijection between these two sets, uh, that moves every point by uh, by finite distance. So basically, we're trying to move every point of one set by some uh, bounded distance, not greater than uh, 100 meters, <clears throat> such that uh, we may get the second set. And it doesn't uh, say anything about how large we need to move, just existence of such bijection. 
And uh, one kind of mathematical way to think about that is that we're trying to uh, organize uh, bounded transport. So you can imagine that there is uh, one kilogram of uh, goods at every point of one set, and we want to move those uh, goods to the other, to the points of the other set. So can we do that by uh, moving every kilogram uh, by at most 100 meters? So, and we cannot split anything. So that's one way to think about it. Uh, there is also a quantitative approach when, when we want to understand what is the distance. <clears throat> and that's uh, what is called the bottleneck distance. So we say that uh, two, so for two sets, for two Delana sets <coughs> that are bounded distance equivalent, <clears throat> We define the bottleneck distance as just minimal distance we can use for those bijections or infimum. In general, uh, you can take minimum here, so you don't have to take uh, infinite. So uh, again, we consider all bijections, and uh, since X and Y are Delana sets, there are countably many points, so there are bijections, and we consider infimum of all possible uh movements here uh in addition and that's uh the notion that allows us not only to uh move between two sets but trying to recognize whether uh two sets are isometric uh it's not that easy but we can try so we uh introduce euclidean bottleneck distance <clears throat> and that's uh the distance uh, or bottleneck distance between a set and every isometry of the second set. So for example, uh, if you have a point set uh, and its rotation, then bottleneck distance uh, could be uh, infinite in general. Uh, but if we consider uh, Euclidean bottleneck distance, then this, uh, this will be zero because we can rotate Y back and they will coincide. So we don't have to move. Anything. So uh, I have introduced the sets that I will try to work with. I have introduced uh, uh, the quantities I'm looking at. So what am I trying to do? So why? Uh, <clears throat> so what? Uh, what is the goal? So first, and uh, that's uh, oops. So that's uh, uh, what I will call uh, the local part. Uh, uh, so the local part over here, the local properties, uh, if we have two sets, just two uh, separate sets without any structure uh, outside of these two sets, so they themselves have some structure, they are usually uh, periodic or cut and project or something like that. So uh, can we say whether they are uh, bounded distance equivalent or not for just for two arbitrary sets? Uh, and that's uh, the first part, and that's not uh, the work with uh, uh, with uh, Giga and Nicola. <clears throat> For the second part, uh, it's uh, more global. So now let's consider the whole family of Dell sets, and let's try to understand what is uh, what are the properties of two metric spaces defined by uh, bottleneck distance and Euclidean bottleneck distance. In, uh, in these sets. So particularly what we want to do, we want to embed these sets into some familiar mat metric spaces when, where, where we can measure distances. And uh, that way we can estimate uh, the bottleneck distance between sets or Euclidean bottleneck distance just by finding the distances in that set, uh, in that metric space where we embedded everything. Uh, that may sound too optimistic, and actually that is too optimistic, but uh, at least we can try to do something. Okay, <clears throat> any questions so far? Okay, so uh, the uh, first uh, question that I will try to answer is, uh, if we have a Delana set, uh, can we find a lattice uh, such that X is bounded distance 
uh, distance equivalent to that lattice. So basically, can we move points of that set to get the lattice? And uh, the motivation here is lattices are the simplest uh, infinite point sets that we're dealing with. So let's try to analyze the simplest case first. And uh, apparently there is an answer uh, and it's not easy. So that's a uh, uh, result of Laskovich from the nineties. <clears throat> and he proved that, uh, and actually that's if and only if condition. So he proved that if we have a Delon asset, then it is a uh, bounded distance uh, equivalent to a scaled integer lattice. So here I have a scaling factor alpha. So basically, uh, increasing the distance between points from one to alpha. If and only if, well, there is this scary inequality. So this scary inequality holds for every bounded and measurable set. So what is written here, uh, so let me draw it. So that part just counts uh, uh, the number of points inside uh, S. So this is S. Uh, that part here, which is one over alpha to the D times D-dimensional volume or D-dimensional Lebesgue measure of that set counts, uh, so roughly counts the number of uh, integer points inside or uh, scaled integer points, uh, <clears throat> right? Because for the uh, volume, uh, so the volume of the set, that's how many, approximately how many integer points are inside. And since we scaled the integer lattice, so that's how many how many points are there for the scaled lattice, and uh, the this so the, the difference between these two should not be very large, and uh, very large uh, means that it is at most a constant times some volume of uh, some did uh, some vol volume of some neighborhood of that set over here. So basically. Uh, the there is a condition based on the uh, on the boundary of that set of how large uh, we can get, so uh, how large that difference may get. And uh, <clears throat> on one hand, uh, it's uh, it's a condition, it's a criterion. On the other hand, it's very complicated to check, right? Because we need to do that for every uh, bounded and measurable set and no one will ever do that, <clears throat> but at least it's, it's a condition. And it's a, a very nice condition because what it does, it says that if we have a relatively round set, then uh, <clears throat> the volume of the boundary is uh, very small compared to the volume of the set itself or volume of the neighborhood of the boundaries, relatively small compared to the volume of the set as well. So that means that the number of points should be approximately equal to the number of the expected points. And that's uh, what we need to do to make, uh, to make that bijection. So actually, that's, uh, that's the idea of the proof. So we start from a set and we uh, consider kind of growing bijections. So, uh, and uh, that's the criterion. It doesn't help a lot but it actually uh, is helpful uh, because if we have some structure uh, for our set, then we can check. It. And one, uh, uh, one notion that is helpful here, uh, it's called density. So <clears throat> I haven't introduced it uh, in the beginning, but I want to introduce it now. So what is density? Uh, roughly speaking, it's uh, just the number of points. So density of, of discrete set is number of points per unit volume. Uh, and uh, it's uh, generally easy to uh, define it for lattices and per for periodic point sets. And that's what I'm going to do uh, on the next slide. But for arbitrary point set, is, it's complicated because uh, when I'm talking about uh, points per unit volume, uh, it's unclear what, uh, what, uh, what volumes I consider. So, and in general, considering just spheres centered at the origin is not enough. And uh, so let me 
uh, just write down that example. So if I consider negative natural numbers uh, union with twice natural numbers, then considering spheres centered at the origin will give me some density. And it's very uh, unusual to think of that set as having density because the left part is uh, twice more dense as the right part. So there is no kind of uniform density here. So the uh, process here for mathematical process here is to consider what is called one one Hove sequences. And that means that we consider, they're also called Fernler sequences. Uh, so we consider sequences of measurable sets where <clears throat> uh, volume of volume around the boundary uh, over volume of the set itself goes to zero for every size of for every uh, size of the boundary, and if uh, those limits, so limits of number of points inside that set over the volume, doesn't depend on the choice of the sequence, then we are going to call the density. So that's complicated mathematical definition, but for our cases, for lattices uh, with unit cell U, density is just one over volume of the unit cell because uh, for every unit cell, we have exactly one point. And if we're dealing with periodic point set, uh, then uh, the density is just a number of the points in the motif over uh, the volume. So this uh, quantity uh, doesn't depend uh, on the uh, so doesn't depend on the representation of the points uh, periodic point set or the lattice. So we if we represent lattice as po periodic point set, we get the same quantity. The same if we uh, take another representation, we also get the same quantity. So similarly, uh, we can use uh, the Cartan project scheme to compute densities for uh, Cartan project sets at least when the <clears throat> parameters are generally nice. And similarly for substitution tilings, uh, I will not do that right now, but the idea is that we are cutting some something from the lattice and that is done in a generally nicely way. So the density of the lattice that we cut transforms into the lattice, uh, in the density of the lattice, uh, in density of the cutting project. Okay. So uh, how densities are related uh, to bounded distance equivalence. So first <coughs> theorem, and that's not chronologically first, it's uh, just uh, the one that is easy to describe and it's uh, due to Dunor and Degui, uh, fr two French physicists. So in 91, they proved that if we have two lattices in d-dimensional space, so then uh, these two lattices are bounded distance equivalent if and only if uh, their densities are the same. And uh, immediately we can get a corollary so that two periodic point sets are bounded distance equivalent if and only if their, their densities are the same. So uh, for lattices and periodic point sets, everything is defined uh, by density. So if we restrict only to that situation, <clears throat> density uh, is the only thing we need. Uh, for cut and project set, uh, it's uh, much more complicated. So if we have, and uh, the first result there was obtained in, uh, in the 60s by Kasten, and uh, that's uh, basically work in number theory, not in geometry. So what he did was he was trying to understand some uh, accurate distribution uh, question about uh, fractional parts of, of irrational multiples. And it goes back to basically a question of, uh, that was studied by Ostrovsky and uh, Hecke. Still reformulating that in terms of cut and project set, he proved that if we have a cut and project set with window, uh, which is also an interval from A to B. So it's a one dimensional direct space, one dimensional internal space. So then there is a condition, if and don't leave condition, when <clears throat> uh, this uh, cousin project set is bounded distance equivalent to a lattice. 
And the condition is that what we're dealing with, uh, that a projection, so B minus A, that vector uh, here should be projection of one of the vectors of the lattice. Uh, uh, one direction here was generalized by Dunoy and Degui uh, in 1990. So they proved uh, that if uh, we have, again, the window, which is projection of fundamental domain of a sub lattice, uh, then uh, the cutting project set is uh, bounded distance equivalent to a lattice. And let me mention one more result without formulating it precisely. So uh, there is a relatively recent uh, result by Grabstadt and Lev. <clears throat> so they proved, uh, they gave a complete classification of measurable windows of for one dimensional cut and project sets, right? And uh, with n dimensional, uh, n dimensional internal space. And that may give us some really nice uh, windows, some fractal windows, for example, with fractal boundaries. Uh, so let me show a bit more pictures. So here's uh, how one can prove that. Uh, and that's basically the uh, idea of uh, Dunoy and Degree. So here, uh, again, uh, we have uh, a cut and project set. So here's my uh, lattice. And now uh, uh, that's uh, the unit cell. So now <clears throat> what we are going to do, we are going to see that the window here, and again, uh, the points that I'm going to project are the white circles in that strip. So here, uh, the a diagonal of that unit cell over here is exactly projected on the window. And the process is the following. So for every, uh, for every uh, white point inside the strip, we kind of raise a pole, a ver vertical pole at that point, and then rotate it to uh, go along the diagonal. So then projection, projecting along that diagonal, we're going to get uh, exactly the uh, points of the lattice, right? So that's uh, that the projection that we're going to get over here. Uh, so those uh, vectors are parallel. So we get something equidistributed. So that's a lattice. And the only thing that is left is to prove that it is bounded distance uh, operation. Well, the reason is because the window is bounded. And uh, that means everything moves by some bounded distance. Uh, <clears throat> so it looks nice for uh, one dimensional case. It works for higher dimensions as well. So for example, uh, with the Penrose styling, it will work as well because uh, the window there is uh, what is called a rhombic triacantahedron. So that's a polytop, three-dimensional polytop with five-fold symmetry. And we can write it as a union of several projections of unit sets. So basically every Penrose styling, uh, every Penrose styling is bounded distance from some lattice. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> Similarly, uh, there is a condition uh, for substitution tilings, and it was uh, obtained by Solomon in, uh, about 10 years ago. And roughly speaking, uh, every substitution tiling uh, can be encoded using substitution matrix. So the leading eigenvalue, or uh, the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue, helps to find density. Uh, if we normalize something. So the second eigenvalue, that, uh, that's the thing that uh, says something about being BD to a lattice or being not BD to a lattice. And uh, it's a relevant, a relevant question why to ask why we always consider BD to a lattice, why not general situation? Uh, the answer is uh, as soon as we uh, move away from lattices, things uh, are going to be too complicated. And uh, that's a result from a paper uh, by Dirk Fretlow, myself, and Lorenzo Sadum uh, from last year. So roughly speaking, uh, there are two situations. 
Uh, so if we have a set and we say that it's a finite lot local complexity, which means that we may see only finitely many local pictures for every size. Uh, so then there are two situations. So either this set is uh, BD to a lattice and then everything that looks the same uh, must be BD to the same lattice or uh, there are uncountably many different uh, sets that look like uh, that one. So here look like uh, X means that we are using the same local patches everywhere, but arrange them differently. And uh, for example, uh, one way to get to that situation. So for example, if I start to, so instead of choosing that window, I take the window of the same length, but translate it along the vertical line, I will get different sets almost all the time. Well, actually all the time because uh, the vertical projection is one-to-one. -one. But uh, in that case, since one set is BD to a lattice, then <clears throat> all of them will be BD to the same lattice. If it is not, then there will be uncountably many uh, different things. Okay, so that's the local part. Uh, now let me uh, go to the global part. So if you uh, were interested only in the new paper that Vitaly, uh, I think, sent in the uh, announcement, that's time to wake up. Uh, so uh, what are the new results and what are the uh, global things here? Uh, so I have about 10 minutes to go over that. So. Uh, just a reminder, what we are trying to do, we are trying to understand uh, what are the uh, global metric space structures uh, in the spaces of Delana sets with, uh, with respect to bottleneck distance or Euclidean bottleneck distance. And uh, as uh, we saw even for cotton project sets, it's complicated. So uh, what we are going to do, we're going to restrict ourselves to periodic point sets only, and we are going to consider uh, the fol following kind of subfamilies. So PPS is just the space of all periodic point sets, the metric space of all periodic point sets with respect to either bottleneck distance or Euclidean bottleneck distance. Then if there is a, a lower index R, that means that we consider packing radius greater than R. And actually that, restricts uh, the situation a lot because uh, uh, as I said before, we want to have periodic point set with the same density. And if we fix density and we add that parameter R, then uh, technically the packing radius cannot be too large because uh, if the density is fixed, then there is the largest packing radius that uh, we may use for periodic point sets. So that's, for example, uh, one of the contributions of Marina Vesovska, what she got uh, field medals, uh, Fields Medal uh, last year. Similarly, if we consider, if we have upper index R capital here, so that means that we consider the covering radius, which is less than some parameter R. And also additionally, if we need density, then we use density copper here, but by default, we say that density is everywhere one or everywhere fixed. So I will usually don't write. And of course we can use combined notations. So both upper and lower index. So that means that we uh, bound covering radius and packing radius at the same time or covering radius and density and so on. And similar notations for the space of lattices. <coughs> so, uh, what are we looking for? So what particular properties we're trying to look for? Uh, so we have two distances, uh, you, uh, bottleneck distance and Euclidean bottleneck distance. And we are trying to understand whether there exists a function from any of the matrix spaces there to uh, Hilbert space. And you may think of that as uh, infinite dimensional space with inner product where it's easy to compute uh, distances or relatively easy to compute distances. You just need to find some of certain series. And 
it's too optimistic uh, to hope for uh, an embedding that doesn't change distances at all. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to find the bi Lipschitz embedding, so where the distance is multiplied uh, by some constant or at most by some constant, or coarse embedding, and that's uh, even more complicated. So basically, we want to preserve some structure. So we want to have two positive valued functions, uh, rho minus and rho plus, <coughs> such that limit of rho minus is infinity, so it grows. <coughs> and uh, the distance between images is kind of bounded by these rho minus and rho plus. So basically, the coarse structure is preserved, but in general, we don't know what, what, what happens, right? And uh, <coughs> the motivation here is that Hilbert space uh, gives us a simple way to find distances. So if we can uh, embed our metric space of periodic point set into a Hilbert space, even coarsely, then we have some idea of, so after computing the distance in the Hilbert space, we may have an idea of what was the distance in the initial space. Right? So it's not about finding that distance, but uh, having an idea what that distance could be. And uh, sometimes we can do that. Unfortunately, uh, for bi Lipschitz embeddings, we cannot do th that. And that's uh, <clears throat> first. Uh, theorem over here. So that's uh, basically says that if we have small uh, packing radius for sufficiently small packing radius and for sufficiently small uh, for, or for sufficiently large covering radius, none of the periodic point sp uh, spaces can be embedded into Hilbert space if we are dealing with bi Lipschitz embedding. And the idea here is that uh, when we have we have a family of lattices that uh, is common to all those spaces before that uh, have pairwise distance bounded away from zero. I think in bottleneck distance, it's uh, one third in Euclidean bottleneck distance is one quarter is the bound. And since there are uncountably many, then uh, it cannot be embedded into any separable space and all Hilbert spaces are separable. Uh, for coarse embedding, there are some uh, positive results. So some of the spaces we may embed into uh, Hilbert space coarsely. And uh, these are spaces here. So lattices with bounded covering radius, packing radius, or both. And also uh, we can extend it to the case of bounded diameter of units, unit cell and bounded cardinality for periodic point sets. <clears throat> and the idea is that we can just track uh, the, or just look at the proof of denoing and Ogi for uh, BD equivalence uh, and just write down the constants there. So uh, let me show you a series of pictures how this can be done. So if we have a uh, lattice of density one, so we want to transform it into the integer lattice because uh, after that, uh, if we no can do the, that with uh, bounded distance or uniformly bounded distance, then we know that the space is bounded itself. And we choose the shortest vector here. So then the process is basically to move points along some coset. So first, we move points along that vector V. So uh, from white points to black points, right? So we get a vector uh, or we get a line that contains vector E2. Then uh, we translate it. So one point will go to E2. And then finally the uh, into the integer lady. So at every step, we can find some bounds uh, on the movements that we make and that makes the whole space bound. <clears throat> so uh, there are also some negative results uh, for coarse embeddings. Uh, so particularly if we have fixed density, 
uh, then if we're dealing with periodic point sets, then uh, just bounding packing radius or covering radius or not bounding anything is not enough. So then we cannot coarsely embed those spaces into Hilbert space, again, with uh, uh, with uh, countable basis. And the idea here is that there is a known construction for coarse non-embeddability, and we just uh, find that construction within periodic point sets. So again, let me show one last picture. So the idea for that is to create uh, a large unit cell for the periodic point set. So on the boundary, we have kind of uh, something that is close to integer lattice, and that allows us to make sure that the boundary is preserved when we consider uh, Euclidean uh, bottleneck distance approach, all isometry. So here, this uh, square is actually parallel pipe, which is packed as densely as possible using the same covering, uh, the same packing radius. And that's, that makes sure that everything is oriented the way we want. And that's the signature part that works for uh, coarse non embeddability So, and there are a lot of technical parameters. So I will try to move from that slide as soon as possible. <clears throat> so, uh, and uh, the last thing uh, that we were unable to find or unable to answer uh, about coarse embeddability of two last spaces. One is the lattices without any restriction, just the density one. So as soon as we impose any restrictions, so either packing radius or covering radius, we know that the space is bounded. And that means it's, it can be coarsely embedded uh, everywhere we want. So it's actually, once it's bounded, we can, uh, coarsely embedded into metric space of, uh, <clears throat> I think, into discrete metric space. Uh, and the second one is periodic point sets uh, with both bounded packing radius and covering radius. Uh, so if we have just one, then as I just said, it's not coarsely embedded. So it's kind of the other way around. So here we know that any restriction gives us positive results. So Removing any one restriction gives us negative result, but for these two, we don't know. And uh, I think uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention and uh, happy holidays. Thank you very much, Alexei. Uh, let us thank Alexei for a detailed presentation. So thank you. Well, yeah, physically or virtually, please. Thank uh, <clears throat> uh, Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, I invite questions. Um, so questions for Alexei from any participants. Greg, please. Oh, um, yeah, I just want to ask about this uh, result of, uh, I don't have the number of the slide. Um, but this is this theorem of Duneau in 1990, that mm -hmm. if a window uh, is a pi two projection of a fundamental domain, then lambda is yes. distance equivalent to a D lattice. I was wondering if that, um, a how necessary that hypothesis was. Because it, uh, seemed, it seemed to me that you could use the ergodic theorem to get rid of it. Uh, it is pretty necessary for that particular setting. So uh, for one-to-one -one case, it's uh, right. So the Kasten theorem says that it's very necessary in the one-and-one -one case. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the ergodic theorem gives uh, I think it gives you an idea uh, of the bound, uh, not the bound, of the density, right? Mm -hmm. So the ergodic theorem will give you uh, that the density exists in that case. So you don't really, you don't have to have a fundamental domain or whatever to get density. Yeah, I mean, but, my pressure of regardicity is that it allows you to 
to have everything turn up with essentially the same density. And that's why it was, right. it was necessary to have that hypothesis. Right. That's true. But I think uh, I may be wrong here, but I think it doesn't say you know, uh, how long will it take. Uh -huh. And uh, this question of how long will it take, that's exactly the bound. So you don't, you cannot have early. So let me go to the. So you're, wor you're worried now about computational complexity as well. No, no, no. No, no, no. It's uh, so. Uh, let me go to back to Latsky's criterion. So you want to have that uh, bound over here. That it's that's not just uh, smaller than the number of points, but you have to kind of one order of magnitude smaller. Uh -huh. And the ergodic theory doesn't guarantee that. Uh -huh. Or at least that's my under. So roughly speaking, <clears throat> uh, let me try to kind of explain it that way. So if you count the number of points inside a cube, large cube, mm -hmm. then uh, the you kind of expect it to be uh, size of, uh, si oh, let me write it down. OK, here I have free space. Mm -hmm. All right, so the number of points here, so if uh, this is C, then you expect it to be constant raised to the power D mm -hmm. for uh, unit density. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, the question is, what is the error here? And uh, ergodic theorem says that it's uh, O small of C to the D. Uh -huh. So it's just that it's smaller than the order that you have. Mm. And that's not small enough and for you. For BD, you need right, capital of C to the D minus one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, so ergodic theorem gives you density and that's great. That's really, that really works for cut and project sets. Uh, that's why we love them. Mm -hmm. But uh, the error is not enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Greg. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank Greg, you. for your question. Um, Alexey, could, could I briefly ask about the first uh, theorem uh, from your paper? You, 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 if, if you, if you show yeah, the relevant slide, you mentioned. Um, all types of spaces. So could I clarify, if you can see the periodic points, uh, sorry, uh, space of periodic point sets with Euclidean uh, bottleneck distance. So it means uh, modular isometries. Right. Yes. So so does it also hold uh, for this particular metric? Yes. Yes. So here, uh, uh, yeah, so those two, both are, yeah, so uh, it's uh, uh, lattice set, you can add friction uh, with covering radius, packing radius or not. So that one, periodic point sets, you can add, uh, or it's better to add both restrictions because after that, everything is larger. So you can add here. The only condition here is that for sufficiently small uh, covering radius and sufficiently large, uh, so sufficiently small packing radius, sufficiently large covering radius. So that's the idea. Because if you have, and you need those restrictions, because if you have, <clears throat> uh, let's say, uh, packing radius of hexagonal lattice, then there is only, that's the only lattice with that density, right? So the, with that uh, packing radius. So it's uh, basically by tuning parameters here, you can get space that consists of one periodic point set or of one lattice only. That's not very uh, exciting. Mm -hmm. So you have to have that kind of degree of freedom. But after that, if you allow sufficiently small R and or sufficiently large R capital, 
then uh, you have uh, that family where the distances are pairwise bounded away from zero. So here and in this comment, in this particular comment, Alexei, uh, if you take different values of alpha, say alpha right. alpha prime, uh, then uh, for any such pair, the lattices uh, will have pairwise distances yeah, away from zero. Yes, I think here, if I remember correctly, it's at least one third. Here mm -hmm. it's uh, at least one quarter. So, so, so this particular inequality is approved in your paper. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay. the idea uh, here is the following. I can <clears throat> briefly kind of explain what's going on. So we have uh, almost integer lattice, but one, uh, so every next layer is kind of shifted. And uh, uh, so this is uh, lambda alpha, uh, this is lambda beta. So uh, one can prove that the only way to achieve that, so this, this interval is of length one. Mm -hmm. So this segment of length one. So the only way to kind of get this bijection is to have this, uh, uh, this vector horizontal as well. Otherwise, we have kind of a sequence of points at distance one, and if it is not horizontal and not vertical, then we will be somewhere inside, and that's very far. Uh, and if it is vertical, when because alpha is not zero, then we kind of will be far as well. And one it is, so once it is, uh, so once it is uh, horizontal, then we just need to match. So we need to solve one dimensional problem mm -hmm. to some extent. And there it's for lattices, uh, for integer lattice or translation of integer lattice, that's uh, simple. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do that with this. You can do similar thing in D dimensions just with a bit more, uh, a bit more careful. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you, Alexei. Uh, let me finally stop.